Chapter Eighteen of the Bride of Lammermoor. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Gillian Hendry. The Bride of Lammermoor by Sir Walter Scott. Chapter Eighteen. Sir, stay at home and take an old man's counsel. Seek not to bask you by a stranger's hearth. Our own blue smoke is warmer than their fire. Domestic food is wholesome, though tis homely, and foreign dainties poisonous, though tasteful. The French Courtesan The master of Ravenswood took an opportunity to leave his guests to prepare for their departure, while he himself made the brief arrangements necessary previous to his absence from Wolf's Crag for a day or two. It was necessary to communicate with Caleb on this occasion, and he found that faithful servitor in his sooty and ruinous den, greatly delighted with the departure of their visitors, and computing how long, with good management, the provisions which had been unexpended might furnish the master's table. "'He's nae belly, God, that's a blessing, and Bucklaw's gang, that could have eaten a horse behind the saddle.' Cresses or water purpy, and a bit eight cake can serve the master for breakfast as well as Caleb. Then for dinner, there's no muckle left on the spool bane. It will brander, though, it will brander very weel. His triumphant calculations were interrupted by the master, who communicated to him, not without some hesitation, his purpose to ride with the Lord Keeper as far as Ravenswood Castle, and to remain there for a day or two. "'The mercy of heaven forbid!' said the old serving-man, turning as pale as the tablecloth which he was folding up. "'And why, Caleb?' said his master. "'Why should the mercy of heaven forbid my returning the Lord Keeper's visit?' "'Oh, sir,' replied Caleb, "'oh, Mr. Edgar, I am your servant, and it ill becomes me to speak, but I am an old servant. I've served both your father and good sir.' and mine to have seen Lord Randall, your great-grandfather, but that was when I was a bairn. And what of all this, Balderstone? said the master. What can it possibly have to do with my paying some ordinary civility to a neighbour? Oh, Mr. Edgar, that is, my lord, answered the butler. Your ain conscience tells you it isna for your father's son to be neighbouring with the like o' him. It isna for the credit of the family. And you were yence come to terms, and to gie ye back your ain, e'en though ye should honour his house wi' your alliance, I shouldna say no, for the young lady is a winsome sweet creature. But keep your ain state with him. I ken the race of them weel. They will think the mair o' ye. Why now, you go farther than I do, Caleb, said the master, drowning a certain degree of consciousness in a forced laugh. You are for marrying me into a family that you will not allow me to visit. How this? and you look as pale as death besides. "'Oh, sir,' repeated Caleb again, "'you would but laugh if I told ye. But Thomas the Rhymer, whose tongue couldna be false, spoke the word of your house that will e'en prove our true if ye go to Ravenswood this day. Oh, that it should e'er have been fulfilled in my time!' "'And what is it, Caleb?' said Ravenswood, wishing to soothe the fears of his old servant. Caleb replied, he had never repeated the lines to living mortal. They were told to him by an old priest that had been confessor to Lord Allan's father when the family were Catholic. But mony a time, he said, I hae sowed the dark words ower to myself, and, well a day, little did I think o' their coming round this day. Truce with your nonsense, and let me hear the doggerel which has put it into your head, said the master impatiently. With a quivering voice and a cheek pale with apprehension, Caleb faltered out the following lines. When the last laird of Ravenswood to Ravenswood shall ride, and woo a dead maiden to be his bride, he shall stable his steed in the Kelpie's flow, and his name shall be lost for evermore. I know the Kelpie's flow well enough, said the master. I suppose at least you mean the quicksand betwixt this tower and Wolf's Hope. But why any man in his senses should stable a steed there? Oh, ever spear onything about that, sir. God forbid we should ken what the prophecy means. But just bide you at hame, and let the strangers ride to Ravenswood by themselves. 
we have done in yach for them, and to do mair would be mair against the credit of the family than in its favour. Well, Caleb, said the master, I give you the best possible credit for your good advice on this occasion. But as I do not go to Ravenswood to seek a bride, dead or alive, I hope I shall choose a better stable for my horse than the Kelpie's quicksand, and especially as I have always had a particular dread of it since a patrol of dragoons were lost there ten years since. My father and I saw them from the tower struggling against the advancing tide, and they were lost long before any help could reach them. "'And they deserved it weel, the southern loons,' said Caleb. "'What had they ado, capering on our sands, "'and hindering a wheen honest folk "'for bringing on shore a drap brandy? "'I hae seen them that busy "'that I would hae fired the old culverin "'or the demi-sacker that's on the south bartizan at them, "'only I was feared they might burst in the gang in aff. "'Caleb's brain was now fully engaged "'with abuse of the English soldiery and excisemen so that his master found no great difficulty in escaping from him and rejoining his guests. All was now ready for their departure, and one of the Lord Keeper's grooms, having saddled the master's steed, they mounted in the courtyard. Caleb had, with much toil, opened the double doors of the outward gate, and thereat stationed himself, endeavouring by the reverential and at the same time consequential air which he assumed to supply, by his own gaunt, wasted, and thin person, the absence of whole baronial establishment of porters, warders, and liveried menials. The keeper returned his deep reverence with a cordial farewell, stooping at the same time from his horse, and sliding into the butler's hand the remuneration which in those days was always given by a departing guest to the domestics of the family where he had been entertained. Lucy smiled on the old man with her usual sweetness, bade him adieu, and deposited her guerdon with a grace of action and a gentleness of accent which could not have failed to have won the faithful retainer's heart, but for Thomas the Rhymer and the successful lawsuit against his master. As it was, he might have adopted the language of the Duke in As You Like It. Thou wouldst have better pleased me with this deed if thou hadst told me of another father. Ravenswood was at the lady's bridal rein, encouraging her timidity, and guiding her horse carefully down the rocky path which led to the moor, when one of the servants announced from the rear that Caleb was calling loudly after them, desiring to speak with his master. Ravenswood felt it would look singular to neglect this summons, although inwardly cursing Caleb for his impertinent officiousness. Therefore he was compelled to relinquish to Mr. Lockhart the agreeable duty in which he was engaged, and to ride back to the gate of the courtyard. Here he was beginning, somewhat peevishly, to ask Caleb the cause of his clamour, when the good old man exclaimed, Whisht, sir, whisht, and let me speak just a word that I couldna say a forefolk. There, putting into his lord's hand the money he had just received, there's three gowd pieces, and you'll want siller up by yonder. But stay, whisht now for the master was beginning to exclaim against this transference. Never say a word, but just see to get them changed at the first town you ride through, for they are brand new for the mint, and can speckle a wee bit. You forget, Caleb, said his master, striving to force back the money on his servant, and extricate the bridle from his hold. You forget that I have some gold pieces left of my own. Keep these to yourself, my old friend, and once more good day to you. I assure you I have plenty. You know you have managed that our living should cost us little or nothing. Ah, weel, said Caleb, these will serve for you another time. But see ye hainyach, for doubtless for the credit of the family there maun be some civility to the servants, and ye maun hae something to mak a show with when they say, Master, will ye bet a broad piece? Then ye maun tack out your purse and say, I care na if I do and tak care no to agree on the articles of the wager, and just put up your purse again, and this is intolerable, Caleb. I really must be gone. And you will go then, said Caleb, loosening his hold upon the master's cloak, and changing his didactics into a pathetic and mournful tone. And you will go, for all I have told you about the prophecy, and the dead bride, and the Kelpie's quicksand. Ah, weel. A wilful man maun hae his way. He that will to Cooper maun to Cooper. 
but pity of your life, sir, if ye be fowling or shooting in the park. Beware of drinking at the mermaiden's well. He's gone. He's down the path arrow flight after her. The head is as clean tain aff the Ravenswood family this day as I would chat the head aff a sibo. The old butler looked long after his master, often clearing away the dew as it rose to his eyes, that he might, as long as possible, distinguish his stately form from those of the other horsemen. Close to her bridle rein, ay, close to her bridle rein, wisely saith the holy man, by this also you may know that woman hath dominion over all men, and without this lass would not our ruin have been altogether fulfilled. With a heart fraught with such sad auguries, did Caleb return to his necessary duties at Wolf's Crag, as soon as he could no longer distinguish the object of his anxiety among the group of riders, which diminished in the distance. In the meantime, the party pursued their route joyfully. Having once taken his resolution, the master of Ravenswood was not of a character to hesitate or pause upon it. He abandoned himself to the pleasure he felt in Miss Ashton's company, and displayed an assiduous gallantry which approached as nearly to gaiety as the temper of his mind and state of his family permitted. The Lord Keeper was much struck with his depth of observation, and the unusual improvement he had derived from his studies. Of these accomplishments Sir William Ashton's profession and habits of society rendered him an excellent judge, and he well knew how to appreciate a quality to which he himself was a total stranger, the brief and decided dauntlessness of the master of Ravenswood's fear. In his heart the Lord Keeper rejoiced at having conciliated an adversary so formidable, while with a mixture of pleasure and anxiety he anticipated the great things his young companion might achieve, were the breath of court favour to fill his sails. What could she desire? he thought, his mind always conjuring up opposition in the person of Lady Ashton to his new prevailing wish. What could a woman desire in a match more than the soppeting of a very dangerous claim, and the alliance of a son-in-law, noble, brave, well-gifted, and highly connected, sure to float whenever the tide set his way, strong, exactly where we are weak, in pedigree and in the temper of a swordsman? Sure, no reasonable woman would hesitate, but, alas, here his argument was stopped by the consciousness that Lady Ashton was not always reasonable, in his sense of the word. To prefer some clownish merce laird to the gallant young nobleman, and to the secure possession of Ravenswood upon terms of easy compromise, it would be the act of a madwoman. Thus pondered the veteran politician, until they reached Bittlebrain's house, where it had been previously settled they were to dine and repose themselves, and prosecute their journey for the afternoon. They were received with an excess of hospitality, and the most marked attention was offered to the master of Ravenswood in particular by their noble entertainers. The truth was that Lord Bittlebrains had obtained his peerage by a great deal of plausibility, an art of building up a character for wisdom upon a very trite style of commonplace eloquence, a steady observation of the changes of the times, and the power of rendering certain political services to those who could best reward them. His lady and he, not feeling quite easy under their new honours, to which use had not adapted their feelings, were very desirous to procure the fraternal countenance of those who were born denizens of the region into which they had been exalted from a lower sphere. The extreme attention which they paid to the master of Ravenswood had its usual effect in exalting his importance in the eyes of the Lord Keeper who, although he had a reasonable degree of contempt for Lord Bittlebrain's general parts, entertained a high opinion of the acuteness of his judgment in all matters of self-interest. "'I wish Lady Ashton had seen this,' was his internal reflection. "'No man knows so well as Bittlebrain's on which side his bread is buttered, and he fawns on the master like a beggar's messon on a cook. And my lady, too, bringing forward her beetle-browed missus to skirl and play upon the virginals, as if she said, pick and choose. They are no more comparable to Lucy than an owl is to a signet, and so they may carry their black brows to a farther market. The entertainment being ended, our travellers, who had still to measure the longest part of their journey, 
resumed their horses, and after the Lord Keeper, the Master, and the domestics had drunk Jock and Doris, or the stirrup cup, in the liquors adapted to their various ranks, the cavalcade resumed its progress. It was dark by the time they entered the avenue of Ravenswood Castle, a long straight line leading directly to the front of the house, flanked with huge elm trees, which sighed to the night wind, as if they compassionated the air of their ancient proprietors, who now returned to their shades in the society, and almost in the retinue, of their new master. Some feelings of the same kind oppressed the mind of the master himself. He gradually became silent, and dropped a little behind the lady, at whose bridal rein he had hitherto waited with such devotion. He well recollected the period when at the same hour in the evening he had accompanied his father, as that nobleman left, never again to return to it, the mansion from which he derived his name and title. The extensive front of the old castle, on which he remembered having often looked back, was then as black as mourning weed. The same front now glanced with many lights, some throwing far forward into the night a fixed and stationary blaze, and others hurrying from one window to another, intimating the bustle and busy preparation preceding their arrival, which had been intimated by an avant courier. The contrast pressed so strongly upon the master's heart as to awaken some of the sterner feelings with which he had been accustomed to regard the new lord of his paternal domain, and to impress his countenance with an air of severe gravity, when, alighted from his horse, he stood in the hall no longer his own, surrounded by the numerous menials of its present owner. The Lord Keeper, when about to welcome him with the cordiality which their late intercourse seemed to render proper, became aware of the change, refrained from his purpose, and only intimated the ceremony of reception by a deep reverence to his guest, seeming thus delicately to share the feelings which predominated on his brow. Two upper domestics, bearing each a huge pair of silver candlesticks, now marshalled the company into a large saloon, or withdrawing room, where new alterations impressed upon Ravenswood the superior wealth of the present inhabitants of the castle. The mouldering tapestry, which in his father's time had half covered the walls of this stately apartment, and half streamed from them in tatters, had given place to a complete finishing of wainscot, the cornice of which, as well as the frames of the various compartments, were ornamented with festoons of flowers and with birds, which, though carved in oak, seemed, such was the art of the chisel, actually to swell their throats and flutter their wings. Several old family portraits of armed heroes of the House of Ravenswood, together with a suit or two of old armour and some military weapons, had given place to those of King William and Queen Mary, or Sir Thomas Hope and Lord Stair, two distinguished Scottish lawyers. The pictures of the Lord Keeper's father and mother were also to be seen, the latter sour, shrewish, and solemn, in her black hood and close pinners, with a book of devotion in her hand, the former exhibiting beneath a black silk Geneva cowl or skull-cap, which sat as close to the head as if it had been shaven, a pinched, peevish, puritanical set of features, terminating in a hungry, reddish, peaked beard, forming on the whole a countenance in the expression of which the hypocrite seemed to contend with the miser and the knave. "'And it is to make room for such scarecrows as these,' thought Ravenswood, "'that my ancestors have been torn down from the walls which they erected.' He looked at them again, and as he looked, the recollection of Lucy Ashton, for she had not entered the apartment with them, seemed less lively in his imagination. There were also two or three Dutch drolleries, as the pictures of Ostad and Teniers were then termed, with one good painting of the Italian school. There was besides a noble full length of the Lord Keeper in his robes of office, placed beside his lady in silk and ermine, a haughty beauty, bearing in her looks all the pride of the house of Douglas from which she was descended. The painter, notwithstanding his skill, overcome by the reality, or perhaps from a suppressed sense of humour, had not been able to give the husband on the canvas that air of awful rule and right supremacy which indicates the full possession of domestic authority. It was obvious at the first glance that despite mace and gold frogs, 
the Lord Keeper was somewhat henpecked. The floor of this fine saloon was laid with rich carpets, huge fires blazed in the double chimneys, and ten silver sconces, reflecting with their bright plates the lights which they supported, made the whole seem as brilliant as day. "'Would you choose any refreshment, master?' said Sir William Ashton, not unwilling to break the awkward silence. He received no answer, the master being so busily engaged in marking the various changes which had taken place in the apartment that he hardly heard the Lord Keeper address him. A repetition of the offer of refreshment, with the addition that the family meal would be presently ready, compelled his attention, and reminded him that he acted a weak, perhaps even a ridiculous, part in suffering himself to be overcome by the circumstances in which he found himself. He compelled himself, therefore, to enter into conversation with Sir William Ashton, with as much appearance of indifference as he could well command. "'You will not be surprised, Sir William, that I am interested in the changes you have made for the better in this apartment. In my father's time, after our misfortunes compelled him to live in retirement, it was little used, except by me as a playroom, when the weather would not permit me to go abroad. In that recess was my little workshop, where I treasured the few carpenter's tools which old Caleb procured for me, and taught me to use. There, in yonder corner, under that handsome silver sconce, I kept my fishing rods and hunting poles, bows and arrows. "'I have a young Berkey,' said the Lord Keeper, willing to change the tone of the conversation, "'of much the same turn. He is never happy save when he is in the field. I wonder he is not here.' Here, Lockhart, send William Shaw for Mr. Henry. I suppose he is, as usual, tied to Lucy's apron-string. That foolish girl, master, draws the whole family after her at her pleasure. Even this allusion to his daughter, though artfully thrown out, did not recall Ravenswood from his own topic. We were obliged to leave, he said, some armour and portraits in this apartment. May I ask where they have been removed to? Why— answered the keeper, with some hesitation. The room was fitted up in our absence, and cadent arma togai is the maxim of lawyers, you know. I am afraid it has been here somewhat too literally complied with. I hope, I believe, they are safe. I am sure I gave orders. May I hope that when they are recovered and put in proper order, you will do me the honour to accept them at my hand, as an atonement for their accidental derangement. The master of Ravenswood bowed stiffly, and with folded arms again resumed his survey of the room. Henry, a spoilt boy of fifteen, burst into the room and ran up to his father. "'Think of Lucy, papa! She has come home so cross and so fractious that she will not go down to the stable to see my new pony that Bob Wilson brought from the Mull of Galloway.' "'I think you were very unreasonable to ask her,' said the keeper." "'Then you are as cross as she is,' answered the boy. "'But when Mamma comes home, she'll claw up both your mittens.' "'Hush your impertinence, you little forward imp,' said his father. "'Where is your tutor?' "'Gone to a wedding at Dunbar. "'I hope he'll get a haggis to his dinner.' And he began to sing the old Scottish song. "'There was a haggis in Dunbar, fal-de-ral and the "'Mony better and few war, fal-de-ral, etc.' "'I am much obliged to Mr. Cordery for his attentions,' said the Lord Keeper. "'And pray, who has had the charge of you while I was away, Mr. Henry?' "'Norman and Bob Wilson, for by my own self.' "'A groom and a gamekeeper, and your own silly self. "'Proper guardians for a young advocate. "'Why, you will never know any statutes but those against shooting red deer, "'killing salmon, and—' "'And speaking of red game—' said the young scapegrace, interrupting his father without scruple or hesitation. Norman has shot a buck, and I showed the branches to Lucy, and she says they have but eight tines, and she says that you killed a deer with Lord Bittlebrain's hounds while you were went away, and, do you know, she says it had ten tines. Is it true? It may have had twenty, Henry, for what I know, but if you go to that gentleman, he can tell you all about it. Go speak to him, Henry. It is the master of Ravenswood." While they conversed thus, the father and son were standing by the fire, and the master, having walked towards the upper end of the apartment, stood with his back towards them, 
apparently engaged in examining one of the paintings. The boy ran up to him and pulled him by the skirt of the coat with the freedom of a spoilt child, saying, I say, sir, if you will please to tell me... But when the master turned round and Henry saw his face, he became suddenly and totally disconcerted, walked two or three steps backward, and still gazed on Ravenswood with an air of fear and wonder which had totally banished from his features their usual expression of pert vivacity. "'Come to me, young gentleman,' said the master, "'and I will tell you all I know about the hunt.' "'Go to the gentleman, Henry,' said his father. "'You are not used to be so shy.' But neither invitation nor exhortation had any effect on the boy. On the contrary, he turned round as soon as he had completed his survey of the master, and walking as cautiously as if he had been treading upon eggs, he glided back to his father, and pressed as close to him as possible. Ravenswood, to avoid hearing the dispute betwixt the father and the overindulged boy, thought it most polite to turn his face once more towards the pictures, and pay no attention to what they said. "'Why do you not speak to the master, you little fool?' said the Lord Keeper. "'I'm afraid.' said Henry, in a very low tone of voice. "'Afraid, you goose!' said his father, giving him a slight shake by the collar. "'What makes you afraid?' "'What makes him to like the picture of Sir Malise Ravenswood, then?' said the boy, whispering. "'What picture, you natural?' said his father. "'I used to think you only a scapegrace, but I believe you will turn out a born idiot.' "'I tell you, it is the picture of old Malise of Ravenswood, "'and he is as like it as if he had lopen out of the canvas, "'and it is up in the old baron's hall that the maids launder the clothes in, "'and it has armour, and not a coat like the gentleman, "'and he has not a beard and whiskers like the picture, "'and it has another kind of thing about the throat, "'and no band-strings as he has, and—' "'And why should not the gentleman be like his ancestor, you silly boy?' "'said the Lord Keeper.' "'Aye, but if he has come to chase us all out of the castle,' said the boy, "'and has twenty men at his back in disguise, "'and has come to say, with a hollow voice, "'I bide my time, and is to kill you on the hearth, "'as Malise did to the other man, "'and whose blood is still to be seen.' "'Hush! Nonsense!' said the Lord Keeper, "'not himself much pleased to hear these disagreeable coincidences "'forced on his notice. "'Master, here comes Lockhart to say supper is served.' and at the same instant Lucy entered at another door, having changed her dress since her return. The exquisite feminine beauty of her countenance, now shaded only by a profusion of sunny tresses, the sylph-like form, disencumbered of her heavy riding-skirt, and mantled in azure silk, the grace of her manner and of her smile, cleared, with a celerity which surprised the master himself, all the gloomy and unfavourable thoughts, which had for some time overclouded his fancy. In those features, so simply sweet, he could trace no alliance with the pinched visage of the peak-bearded, black-capped Puritan, or his starched, withered spouse, with the craft expressed in the Lord Keeper's countenance, or the haughtiness which predominated in that of his lady. And while he gazed on Lucy Ashton, she seemed to be an angel descended on earth, unallied to the coarse mortals among whom she deigned to dwell for a season. Such is the power of beauty over a youthful and enthusiastic fancy. End of chapter 18 Chapter 19 of The Bride of Lammermoor This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Gillian Hendry The Bride of Lammermoor by Sir Walter Scott Chapter 19 I do too ill in this, and must not think but that a parent's plaint will move the heavens to pour forth misery upon the head of disobediency. Yet reason tells us parents are o'erseen, when with too strict a reign they do hold in their child's affection, and control that love which the high powers divine inspire them with. The hog hath lost his pearl. The feast of Ravenswood Castle was as remarkable for its profusion as that of Wolf's Crag had been for its ill-veiled penury. 
the Lord Keeper might feel internal pride at the contrast, but he had too much tact to suffer it to appear. On the contrary, he seemed to remember with pleasure what he called Mr. Balderstone's bachelor's meal, and to be rather disgusted than pleased with the display upon his own groaning board. "'We do these things,' he said, "'because others do them. But I was bred a plain man at my father's frugal table, and I should like well, would my wife and family permit me to return to my sons and my poor man of mutton. This was a little overstretched. The master only answered that different ranks, I mean, said he, correcting himself, different degrees of wealth, require a different style of housekeeping. This dry remark put a stop to further conversation on the subject, nor is it necessary to record that which was substituted in its place. The evening was spent with freedom, and even cordiality, and Henry had so far overcome his first apprehensions that he had settled a party for coursing a stag with the representative and living resemblance of grim Sir Malise of Ravenswood, called the Revenger. The next morning was the appointed time. It rose upon active sportsmen and successful sport. The banquet came in course, and a pressing invitation to tarry yet another day was given and accepted. This Ravenswood had resolved should be the last of his stay, but he recollected he had not yet visited the ancient and devoted servant of his house, old Alice, and it was but kind to dedicate one morning to the gratification of so ancient an adherent. To visit Alice, therefore, a day was devoted, and Lucy was the master's guide upon the way. Henry, it is true, accompanied them, and took from their walk the air of a tete-a-tete, -tete, while in reality it was little else, considering the variety of circumstances which occurred to prevent the boy from giving the least attention to what passed between his companions. Now a rook settled on a branch within shot, Anon a hare crossed their path, and Henry and his greyhound went astray in pursuit of it. Then he had to hold a long conversation with the forester, which detained him a while behind his companions. And again he went to examine the earth of a badger, which carried him on a good way before them. The conversation betwixt the master and his sister, meanwhile, took an interesting and almost a confidential turn. She could not help mentioning her sense of the pain he must feel in visiting scenes so well known to him, bearing now an aspect so different, and so gently was her sympathy expressed that Ravenswood felt it for a moment as a full requital of all his misfortunes. Some such sentiment escaped him, which Lucy heard with more of confusion than displeasure, and she may be forgiven the imprudence of listening to such language considering that the situation in which she was placed by her father seemed to authorise Ravenswood to use it. Yet she made an effort to turn the conversation, and she succeeded, for the master also had advanced farther than he intended, and his conscience had instantly checked him when he found himself on the verge of speaking of love to the daughter of Sir William Ashton. They now approached the hut of old Alice, which had of late been rendered more comfortable and presented an appearance less picturesque, perhaps, but far neater than before. The old woman was on her accustomed seat beneath the weeping birch, basking with the listless enjoyment of age and infirmity in the beams of the autumn sun. At the arrival of her visitors, she turned her head towards them. "'I hear your step, Miss Ashton,' she said, "'but the gentleman who attends you is not my lord your father.' "'And why should you think so, Alice?' said Lucy. "'Or how is it possible for you to judge so accurately by the sound of a step on this firm earth and in the open air? "'My hearing, my child, has been sharpened by my blindness, "'and I can now draw conclusions from the slightest sounds "'which formerly reached my ears as unheeded as they now approach yours. "'Necessity is a stern but an excellent schoolmistress.' and she that has lost her sight must collect her information from other sources. "'Well, you hear a man's step, I grant it,' said Lucy. "'But why, Alice, may it not be my father's?' "'The pace of age, my love, is timid and cautious, 
the foot takes leave of the earth slowly, and is planted down upon it with hesitation. It is the hasty and determined step of youth that I now hear, and, could I give credit to so strange a thought, I should say it was the step of a Ravenswood. "'This is indeed,' said Ravenswood, "'an acuteness of organ which I could not have credited had I not witnessed it. I am indeed the master of Ravenswood, Alice, the son of your old master.' "'You!' said the old woman, with almost a scream of surprise. "'You, the master of Ravenswood, here, in this place, and thus accompanied. I cannot believe it. Let me pass my old hand over your face, that my touch may bear witness to my ears.' The master sat down beside her on the earthen bank, and permitted her to touch his features with her trembling hand. "'It is indeed,' she said. It is the features as well as the voice of Ravenswood, the high lines of pride, as well as the bold and haughty tone. But what do you hear, Master of Ravenswood? What do you in your enemy's domain, and in company with his child? As old Alice spoke, her face kindled, as probably that of an ancient feudal vassal might have done, in whose presence his youthful liege lord had showed some symptom of degenerating from the spirit of his ancestors. "'The master of Ravenswood,' said Lucy, who liked not the tone of this expostulation, and was desirous to abridge it, "'is upon a visit to my father.' "'Indeed,' said the old blind woman, in an accent of surprise. "'I knew,' continued Lucy, I should do him a pleasure by conducting him to your cottage. Where, to say the truth, Alice, said Ravenswood, I expected a more cordial reception. It is most wonderful, said the old woman, muttering to herself, but the ways of heaven are not like our ways, and its judgments are brought about by means far beyond our fathoming. Hearken, young man, she said, your fathers were implacable, but they were honourable foes. They sought not to ruin their enemies under the mask of hospitality. What have you to do with Lucy Ashton? Why should your steps move in the same footpath with hers? Why should your voice sound in the same chord and time with those of Sir William Ashton's daughter? Young man, he who aims at revenge by dishonourable means— Be silent, woman, said Ravenswood sternly. Is it the devil that prompts your voice? Know that this young lady has not on earth a friend who would venture farther to save her from injury or from insult. And is it even so? said the old woman, in an altered but melancholy tone. Then God help you both. Amen, Alice, said Lucy, who had not comprehended the import of what the blind woman had hinted. And send you your senses, Alice and your good humour. If you hold this mysterious language, instead of welcoming your friends, they will think of you as other people do. And how do other people think? said Ravenswood, for he also began to believe the old woman spoke with incoherence. They think, said Henry Ashton, who came up at that moment, and whispered into Ravenswood's ear, that she is a witch that should have been burned with them that suffered at Haddington. "'What is it you say?' said Alice, turning towards the boy, her sightless visage inflamed with passion. "'That I am a witch, and ought to have suffered with the helpless old wretches who were murdered at Haddington?' "'Hear to that now,' again whispered Henry, "'and me whispering lower than a wren cheeps. "'If the usurer and the oppressor and the grinder of the poor man's face "'and the remover of ancient landmarks,' and the subverter of ancient houses, were at the same stake with me, I could say, light to the fire, in God's name. This is dreadful, said Lucy. I have never seen the poor deserted woman in this state of mind. But age and poverty can ill bear reproach. Come, Henry, we will leave her for the present. She wishes to speak with the master alone. We will walk homeward and rest us, she added, looking at Ravenswood by the mermaiden's well. "'And Alice,' said the boy, "'if you know of any hare that comes through among the deer, and makes them drop their calves out of season, 
You may tell her, with my compliments to command, that if Norman has not got a silver bullet ready for her, I'll lend him one of my doublet buttons on purpose. Alice made no answer till she was aware that the sister and brother were out of hearing. She then said to Ravenswood, "'And you, too, are angry with me for my love? It is just that strangers should be offended, but you, too, are angry.' "'I am not angry, Alice,' said the master, "'only surprised that you, whose good sense I have heard so often praised, should give way to offensive and unfounded suspicions.' "'Offensive?' said Alice. "'I trust is ever offensive, but surely not unfounded.' "'I tell you, dame, most groundless,' replied Ravenswood. "'Then the world has changed its want, and the Ravenswoods their hereditary temper, and the eyes of old Alice's understanding are yet more blind than those of her countenance. When did a Ravenswood seek the house of his enemy, but with the purpose of revenge?' And hither are you come, Edgar Ravenswood, either in fatal anger or in still more fatal love. In neither, said Ravenswood. I give you mine honour. I mean, I assure you. Alice could not see his blushing cheek, but she noticed his hesitation, and that he retracted the pledge which he seemed at first disposed to attach to his denial. It is so, then, she said and therefore she is to tarry by the mermaiden's well. Often has it been called a place fatal to the race of Ravenswood. Often has it proved so. But never was it likely to verify old sayings as much as on this day. "'You drive me to madness, Alice,' said Ravenswood. "'You are more silly and more superstitious than old Balderstone. Are you such a wretched Christian as to suppose I would in the present day levy war against the Ashton family, as was the sanguinary custom in elder times? Or do you suppose me so foolish that I cannot walk by a young lady's side without plunging headlong in love with her? My thoughts, replied Alice, are my own, and if my mortal sight is closed to objects present with me, it may be I can look with more steadiness into future events. Are you prepared to sit lowest at the board, which was once your father's own, unwillingly, as a connection and ally of his proud successor? Are you ready to live on his bounty, to follow him in the by-paths of intrigue and chicane, which none can better point out to you, to gnaw the bones of his prey, when he has devoured the substance? Can you say, as Sir William Ashton says, think as he thinks, vote as he votes, and call your father's murderer your worshipful father-in-law and revered patron? Master of Ravenswood, I am the eldest servant of your house, and I would rather see you shrouded and coffined. The tumult in Ravenswood's mind was uncommonly great. She struck upon and awakened a chord which he had for some time successfully silenced. He strode backwards and forwards through the little garden with a hasty pace, and at length checking himself, and stopping right opposite to Alice, he exclaimed, Woman, on the verge of the grave, dare you urge the son of your master to blood and to revenge? God forbid, said Alice solemnly, and therefore I would have you depart these fatal bounds, where your love, as well as your hatred, threatens sure mischief, or at least disgrace both to yourself and others. I would shield, were it in the power of this withered hand, the Ashtons from you, and you from them, and both from their own passions. You can have nothing, ought to have nothing, in common with them. Be gone from among them, and if God has destined vengeance on the oppressor's house, do not you be the instrument. I will think on what you have said, Alice, said Ravenswood more composedly. I believe you mean truly and faithfully by me, but you urge the freedom of an ancient domestic somewhat too far. But farewell, and if heaven afford me better means, I will not fail to contribute to your comfort. He attempted to put a piece of gold into her hand, which she refused to receive, and in the slight struggle attending his wish to force it upon her, it dropped to the earth. Let it remain an instant on the ground, said Alice, as the master stooped to raise it. 
and believe me, that piece of gold is an emblem of her whom you love. She is as precious, I grant, but you must stoop even to abasement before you can win her. For me, I have as little to do with gold as with earthly passions, and the best news that the world has in store for me is that Edgar Ravenswood is a hundred miles distant from the seat of his ancestors, with a determination never again to behold it. Valis, said the master, who began to think this earnestness had some more secret cause than arose from anything that the blind woman could have gathered from this casual visit. I have heard you praised by my mother for your sense, acuteness, and fidelity. You are no fool to start at shadows, or to dread old superstitious saws like Caleb Balderstone. Tell me distinctly where my danger lies, if you are aware of any which is tending towards me. If I know myself, I am free from all such views respecting Miss Ashton as you impute to me. I have necessary business to settle with Sir William. That arranged, I shall depart, and with as little wish, as you may easily believe, to return to a place full of melancholy subjects of reflection, as you have to see me here. Alice bent her sightless eyes on the ground, and was for some time plunged in deep meditation. "'I will speak the truth,' she said at length, raising up her head. "'I will tell you the source of my apprehensions, whether my candour be for good or for evil. Lucy Ashton loves you, Lord of Ravenswood.' "'It is impossible,' said the master. "'A thousand circumstances have proved it to me.' replied the blind woman. Her thoughts have turned on no one else since you saved her from death, and that my experienced judgment has won from her own conversation. Having told you this, if you are indeed a gentleman and your father's son, you will make it a motive for flying from her presence. Her passion will die like a lamp for want of that the flame should feed upon. But if you remain here, her destruction or yours or that of both, will be the inevitable consequence of her misplaced attachment. I tell you this secret unwillingly, but it could not have been hid long from your own observation, and it is better you learn it from mine. Depart, Master of Ravenswood, you have my secret. If you remain an hour under Sir William Ashton's roof, without the resolution to marry his daughter, you are a villain." If, with the purpose of allying yourself with kin, you are an infatuated and predestined fool. So saying, the old blind woman arose, assumed her staff, and, tottering to her hut, entered it and closed the door, leaving Ravenswood to his own reflections. End of chapter 19「私は私の家族で私は私の家族で私は私の家族で私は私の家族で私は私の家族で私は私の家族で私は私の家族で私は私の家族で私は私の家族で私は私の家族で私は私の家族で私は私の家族で私は私の家族で私は私の家族で私は私の家族で私は私の家族で私は私の家族で私は私の家族で私は私Lone sitting by the shores of old romance. Wordsworth. The meditations of Ravenswood were of a very mixed complexion. He saw himself at once in the very dilemma which he had for some time felt apprehensive he might be placed in. The pleasure he felt in Lucy's company had indeed approached to fascination, yet it had never altogether surmounted his internal reluctance to wed with the daughter of his father's foe, and even in forgiving Sir William Ashton the injuries which his family had received, and giving him credit for the kind intentions he professed to entertain, he could not bring himself to contemplate as possible an alliance betwixt their houses. Still he felt that Alice spoke truth, and that his honour now required he should take an instant leave of Ravenswood Castle or become a suitor of Lucy Ashton. The possibility of being rejected, too, should he make advances to her wealthy and powerful father, to sue for the hand of an Ashton and be refused, this were a consummation too disgraceful. 
I wish her well, he said to himself, and for her sake I forgive the injuries her father has done to my house, but I will never, no, never see her more. With one bitter pang he adopted this resolution, just as he came to where two paths parted, the one to the mermaiden's fountain, where he knew Lucy waited him, the other leading to the castle by another and more circuitous road. He paused an instant when about to take the latter path, thinking what apology he should make for conduct which must needs seem extraordinary, and had just muttered to himself, "'Sudden news from Edinburgh. Any pretext will serve. Only let me dally no longer here.' When young Henry came flying up to him, half out of breath, "'Master! Master! You must give Lucy your arm back to the castle, for I cannot give her mine. For Norman is waiting for me, and I am to go with him to make his ring walk, and I would not stay away for a gold jacobus, and Lucy is afraid to walk home alone, though all the wild nout have been shot, and so you must come away directly. Betwixt two scales equally loaded, a feather's weight will turn the scale. It is impossible for me to leave the young lady in the wood alone, said Ravenswood. To see her once more can be of little consequence after the frequent meetings we have had. I ought, too, in courtesy, to apprise her of my intention to quit the castle. And having thus satisfied himself that he was taking not only a wise, but an absolutely necessary step, he took the path to the fatal fountain. Henry no sooner saw him on the way to join his sister than he was off like lightning in another direction, to enjoy the society of the forester in their congenial pursuits. Ravenswood, not allowing himself to give a second thought to the propriety of his own conduct, walked with a quick step towards the stream, where he found Lucy seated alone by the ruin. She sat upon one of the disjointed stones of the ancient fountain, and seemed to watch the progress of its current, as it bubbled forth to daylight, in gay and sparkling profusion, from under the shadow of the ribbed and darksome vault, with which veneration, or perhaps remorse, had canopied its source. To a superstitious eye, Lucy Ashton, folded in her plaided mantle, with her long hair escaping partly from the snood and falling upon her silver neck, might have suggested the idea of the murdered nymph of the fountain. But Ravenswood only saw a female exquisitely beautiful, and rendered yet more so in his eyes, how could it be otherwise, by the consciousness that she had placed her affections on him. As he gazed on her, he felt his fixed resolution melting like wax in the sun, and hastened, therefore, from his concealment in the neighbouring thicket. She saluted him, but did not arise from the stone on which she was seated. "'My madcap brother,' she said, "'has left me, but I expect him back in a few minutes. For fortunately, as anything pleases him for a minute, nothing has charms for him much longer.' Ravenswood did not feel the power of informing Lucy that her brother meditated a distant excursion, and would not return in haste. He sat himself down on the grass, at some little distance from Miss Ashton, and both were silent for a short space. "'I like this spot,' said Lucy at length, as if she found the silence embarrassing. "'The bubbling murmur of the clear fountain, the waving of the trees—' the profusion of grass and wildflowers that rise among the ruins, make it like a scene in romance. I think, too, I have heard it is a spot connected with the legendary lore which I love so well. It has been thought, answered Ravenswood, a fatal spot to my family, and I have some reason to term it so, for it was here I first saw Miss Ashton, and it is here I must take my leave of her for ever. The blood which the first part of this speech called into Lucy's cheeks, was speedily expelled by its conclusion. "'To take leave of us, master?' she exclaimed. "'What can have happened to hurry you away? I know Alice hates, I mean, dislikes, my father, and I hardly understood her humour to-day, it was so mysterious. But I am certain my father is sincerely grateful for the high service you rendered us. Let me hope that, having won your friendship hardly, we shall not lose it lightly. Lose it, Miss Ashton, said the master of Ravenswood. No, wherever my fortune calls me, whatever she inflicts upon me, it is your friend, your sincere friend, 
who acts and suffers. But there is a fate on me, and I must go, or I shall add the ruin of others to my own. Yet do not go from us, master, said Lucy, as she laid her hand in all simplicity and kindness upon the skirt of his cloak as if to detain him. You shall not part from us. My father is powerful. He has friends that are more so than himself. Do not go till you see what his gratitude will do for you. Believe me, he is already labouring in your behalf with the council. It may be so, said the master proudly. Yet it is not to your father, Miss Ashton, but to my own exertions that I ought to owe success in the career on which I am about to enter. My preparations are already made. A sword and a cloak, and a bold heart and a determined hand. Lucy covered her head in her hands, and the tears, in spite of her, forced their way between her fingers. "'Forgive me,' said Ravenswood, taking her right hand, which, after slight resistance, she yielded to him, still continuing to shade her face with the left. "'I am too rude, too rough, too intractable, to deal with any being so soft and gentle as you are. Forget that so stern a vision has crossed your path of life, and let me pursue mine, sure that I can meet with no worse misfortune after the moment it divides me from your side. Lucy wept on, but her tears were less bitter. Each attempt which the master made to explain his purpose of departure only proved a new evidence of his desire to stay, until at length, instead of bidding her farewell, he gave his faith to her for ever, and received her troth in return. The whole passed so suddenly, and arose so much out of the immediate impulse of the moment, that ere the master of Ravenswood could reflect upon the consequences of the step which he had taken, their lips, as well as their hands, had pledged the sincerity of their affection. "'And now,' he said, after a moment's consideration, "'it is fit I should speak to Sir William Ashton.' He must know of our engagement. Ravenswood must not seem to dwell under his roof to solicit clandestinely the affections of his daughter. "'You would not speak to my father on the subject?' said Lucy doubtingly, and then added more warmly, "'Oh, do not, do not! Let your lot in life be determined, your station and purpose ascertained before you address my father. I am sure he loves you, I think he will consent, but then my mother—' She paused, ashamed to express the doubt she felt how far her father dared to form any positive resolution on this most important subject without the consent of his lady. "'Your mother, my Lucy,' replied Ravenswood, "'she is of the house of Douglas, a house that has intermarried with mine even when its glory and power were at the highest. What could your mother object to my alliance?' "'I did not say object,' said Lucy, but she is jealous of her rights, and may claim a mother's title to be consulted in the first instance. Be it so, replied Ravenswood. London is distant, but a letter will reach it, and receive an answer, within the fortnight. I will not press on the Lord Keeper for an instant reply to my proposal. But, hesitated Lucy, were it not better to wait, to wait a few weeks? Were my mother to see you, to know you, I am sure she would approve, but you are unacquainted personally, and the ancient feud between the families. Ravenswood fixed upon her his keen dark eyes, as if he was desirous of penetrating into her very soul. Lucy, he said, I have sacrificed to you projects of vengeance long nursed, and sworn to with ceremonies little better than heathen. I sacrificed them to your image ere I knew the worth which it represented. In the evening which succeeded my poor father's funeral, I cut a lock from my hair, and as it consumed in the fire, I swore that my rage and revenge should pursue his enemies, until they shrivelled before me like that scorched-up symbol of annihilation. "'It was a deadly sin,' said Lucy, turning pale, "'to make a vow so fatal.' "'I acknowledge it,' said Ravenswood and it had been a worse crime to keep it. It was for your sake that I abjured these purposes of vengeance, though I scarce knew that such was the argument by which I was conquered, until I saw you once more, and became conscious of the influence you possessed over me. 
and why do you now said lucy recall sentiments so terrible sentiments so inconsistent with those you profess for me with those your importunity has prevailed on me to acknowledge because said her lover i would impress on you the price at which i have bought your love the right i have to expect your constancy i say not that i have bartered for it the honour of my house its last remaining possession but though i say it not and think it not i cannot conceal from myself that the world may do both if such are your sentiments said lucy you have played a cruel game with me but it is not too late to give it over take back the faith and troth which you could not plight to me without suffering abatement of honour let what is past be as if it had not been forget me i will endeavour to forget myself you do me injustice said the master of ravenswood by all i hold true and honourable you do me the extremity of injustice if i mention the price at which i have bought your love it is only to show how much i prize it to bind our engagement by a still firmer tie and to show by what i have done to attain this station in your regard how much i must suffer should you ever break your faith and why ravenswood answered lucy should you think that possible why should you urge me with even the mention of infidelity is it because i ask you to delay applying to my father for a little space of time bind me by what vows you please if vows are unnecessary to secure constancy they may yet prevent suspicion ravenswood pleaded apologized and even kneeled to appease her displeasure and lucy as placable as she was single-hearted readily forgave the offence which his doubts had implied the dispute thus agitated however ended by the lovers going through an emblematic ceremony of their troth plight of which the vulgar still preserve some traces they broke betwixt them the thin broad piece of gold which alice had refused to receive from ravenswood and never shall this leave my bosom said lucy as she hung the piece of gold round her neck and concealed it with her handkerchief until you edgar ravenswood ask me to resign it to you and while i wear it never shall that heart acknowledge another love than yours with like protestations ravenswood placed his portion of the coin opposite to his heart and now at length it struck them that time had hurried fast on during this interview and their absence at the castle would be subject of remark if not of alarm as they rose to leave the fountain which had been witness of their mutual engagement an arrow whistled through the air and struck a raven perched on the sere branch of an old oak near to where they had been seated the bird fluttered a few yards and dropped at the feet of lucy whose dress was stained with some spots of its blood miss ashton was much alarmed and ravenswood surprised and angry looked everywhere for the marksman who had given them a proof of his skill as little expected as desired he was not long of discovering himself being no other than henry ashton who came running up with a crossbow in his hand i knew i should startle you he said and do you know you looked so busy that i hoped it would have fallen souse on your heads before you were aware of it what was the master saying to you lucy i was telling your sister what an idle lad you were keeping us waiting here for you so long said ravenswood to save lucy's confusion waiting for me why i told you to see lucy home and that i was to go to make the ring walk with old norman in the hayberry thicket and you may be sure that would take a good hour and we have all the deer's marks and furnishes got while you were sitting here with lucy like a lazy loon well well mr henry said ravenswood but let us see how you will answer to me for killing the raven do you know the ravens are all under the protection of the lords of ravenswood and to kill one in their presence is such bad luck that it deserves a stab and that's what norman said replied the boy he came as far with me as within a flight shot of you and he said he never saw a raven sit still so near living folk and he wished it might be for good luck for the raven is one of the wildest birds that flies unless it be a tame one and so i crept on and on till i was within three score yards of him and then whiz went the bolt and there he lies faith 
was it not well shot and i dare say i have not shot in a crossbow not ten times maybe admirably shot indeed said ravenswood and you will be a fine marksman if you practice hard and that's what norman says answered the boy but i am sure it is not my fault if i do not practice enough for of free will i would do little else only my father and tutor are angry sometimes and only miss lucy there gives herself airs about my being busy for all she can sit idle by a well-side the whole day when she has a handsome young gentleman to prate with i have known her do so twenty times if she will believe me the boy looked at his sister as he spoke and in the midst of his mischievous chatter had the sense to see that he was really inflicting pain upon her, though without being able to comprehend the cause or the amount. "'Come now, Lucy,' he said, "'don't greet, and if I have said anything beside the mark, I'll deny it again. And what does the master of Ravenswood care if you had a hundred sweethearts? So ne'er put finger in your eye about it.' The master of Ravenswood was for the moment scarce satisfied with what he heard, yet his good sense naturally regarded it as the chatter of a spoilt boy who strove to mortify his sister in the point which seemed most accessible for the time but although of a temper equally slow in receiving impressions and obstinate in retaining them the prattle of henry served to nourish in his mind some vague suspicion that his present engagement might only end in his being exposed like a conquered enemy in a roman triumph a captive attendant on the car of a victor who meditated only satiating his pride at the expense of the vanquished there was we repeat it no real ground whatever for such an apprehension nor could he be said seriously to entertain such for a moment indeed it was impossible to look at the clear blue eye of lucy ashton and entertain the slightest permanent doubt concerning the sincerity of her disposition still however conscious pride and conscious poverty combined to render a mind suspicious which in more fortunate circumstances would have been a stranger to that as well as to every other meanness they reached the castle where sir william ashton who had been alarmed by the length of their stay met them in the hall had lucy he said been in any other company than that of one who had shown he had so complete power of protecting her he confessed he should have been very uneasy and would have dispatched persons in quest of them but in the company of the master of ravenswood he knew his daughter had nothing to dread lucy commenced some apology for their long delay but conscience struck became confused as she proceeded and when ravenswood coming to her assistance endeavoured to render the explanation complete and satisfactory he only involved himself in the same disorder like one who endeavouring to extricate his companion from a sloch entangles himself in the same tenacious swamp it cannot be supposed that the confusion of the two youthful lovers escaped the observation of the subtle lawyer accustomed by habit and profession to trace human nature through all her windings but it was not his present policy to take any notice of what he observed he desired to hold the master of ravenswood bound but wished that he himself should remain free and it did not occur to him that his plan might be defeated by lucy's returning the passion which he hoped she might inspire if she should adopt some romantic feelings towards ravenswood in which circumstances or the positive and absolute opposition of lady ashton might render it unadvisable to indulge her the lord keeper conceived they might be easily superseded and annulled by a journey to edinburgh or even to london a new set of brussels lace and the soft whispers of half a dozen lovers anxious to replace him whom it was convenient she should renounce this was his provision for the worst view of the case but according to its more probable issue any passing favours she might entertain for the master of ravenswood might require encouragement rather than repression this seemed the more likely as he had that very morning since their departure from the castle received a letter the contents of which he hastened to communicate to ravenswood a foot-post had arrived with a packet to the lord keeper from that friend whom we have already mentioned who was labouring hard underhand to consolidate a band of patriots at the head of whom stood sir william's greatest terror the active and ambitious marquis of a the success of this convenient friend had been such that he had obtained from sir william not indeed a directly favourable answer 
but certainly a most patient hearing. This he had reported to his principal, who had replied by the ancient French adage, Château qui parle et femme qui écoute, l'un et l'autre va se rendre. A statesman who hears you propose a change of measures without reply was, according to the Marquis's opinion, in the situation of the fortress which parleys and the lady who listens, and he resolved to press the siege of the Lord Keeper. The packet, therefore, contained a letter from his friend and ally, and another from himself to the Lord Keeper, frankly offering an unceremonious visit. They were crossing the country to go to the southward. The roads were indifferent, the accommodation of the inns as execrable as possible. The Lord Keeper had been long acquainted intimately with one of his correspondents, and though more slightly known to the Marquis, had yet enough of his Lordship's acquaintance to render the visit sufficiently natural, and to shut the mouths of those who might be disposed to impute it to a political intrigue. He instantly accepted the offered visit, determined, however, that he would not pledge himself an inch farther from the furtherance of their views than reason, by which he meant his own self-interest, should plainly point out to him as proper. Two circumstances particularly delighted him, the presence of Ravenswood and the absence of his own lady. By having the former under his roof, he conceived he might be able to quash all such hazardous and hostile proceedings as he might otherwise have been engaged in, under the patronage of the Marquis. And Lucy, he foresaw, would make, for his immediate purpose of delay and procrastination, a much better mistress of his family than her mother, who would, he was sure, in some shape or other, contrive to disconcert his political schemes by her proud and implacable temper. His anxious solicitations that the master would stay to receive his kinsman were, of course, readily complied with, since the eclaircissement which had taken place at the mermaiden's fountain had removed all wish for sudden departure. Lucy and Lockhart had therefore orders to provide all things necessary in their different departments for receiving the expected guests with a pomp and display of luxury very uncommon in Scotland at that remote period. End of chapter 20 Chapter 21 of The Bride of Lammermoor This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Gillian Hendry The Bride of Lammermoor by Sir Walter Scott Chapter 21 Maral Sir, the man of honours come, newly alighted, overreach, in without reply, and do as I command. Is the loud music I gave order for ready to receive him? New way to pay old debts. Sir William Ashton, although a man of sense, legal information, and great practical knowledge of the world, had yet some points of character which corresponded better with the timidity of his disposition, and the supple arts by which he had risen in the world, than to the degree of eminence which he had attained, as they tended to show an original mediocrity of understanding, however highly it had been cultivated, and a native meanness of disposition, however carefully veiled. He loved the ostentatious display of his wealth, less as a man to whom habit has made it necessary, than as one to whom it is still delightful from its novelty. The most trivial details did not escape him, and Lucy soon learned to watch the flush of scorn which crossed Ravenswood's cheek, when he heard her father gravely arguing with Lockhart, nay, even with the old housekeeper, upon circumstances which, in families of rank, are left uncared for, because it is supposed impossible they can be neglected. "'I could pardon Sir William,' said Ravenswood, one evening after he had left the room, "'some general anxiety upon this occasion, for the Marquis's visit is an honour, and should be received as such. But I am worn out by these miserable minutiae of the buttery and the larder and the very hen-coop, they drive me beyond my patience. I would rather endure the poverty of Wolf's Crag than be pestered with the wealth of Ravenswood Castle. And yet, said Lucy, it was by attention to these minutiae that my father acquired the property. Which my ancestors sold for lack of it, replied Ravenswood. Be it so, 
a porter still bears but a burden, though the burden be of gold. Lucy sighed. She perceived too plainly that her lover held in scorn the manners and habits of a father to whom she had long looked up to as her best and most partial friend, whose fondness had often consoled her for her mother's contemptuous harshness. The lovers soon discovered that they differed upon other and no less important topics. Religion, the mother of peace, was in those days of discord so much misconstrued and mistaken that her rules and forms were the subject of the most opposite opinions and the most hostile animosities. The Lord Keeper, being a Whig, was of course a Presbyterian, and had found it convenient at different periods to express greater zeal for the Kirk than perhaps he really felt. His family equally, of course, were trained under the same institution. Ravenswood, as we know, was a high churchman, or Episcopalian, and frequently objected to Lucy the fanaticism of some of her own communion, while she intimated, rather than expressed, horror at the latitudinarian principles which she had been taught to think connected with the prelatical form of church government. Thus, although their mutual affection seemed to increase rather than to be diminished, as their characters opened more fully on each other, the feelings of each were mingled with some less agreeable ingredients. Lucy felt a secret awe amid all her affection for Ravenswood. His soul was of a higher, prouder character than those with whom she had hitherto mixed in intercourse. His ideas were more fierce and free, and he condemned many of the opinions which had been inculcated upon her as chiefly demanding her veneration. On the other hand, Ravenswood saw in Lucy a soft and flexible character, which, in his eyes at least, seemed too susceptible of being moulded to any form by those with whom she lived. He felt that his own temper required a partner of a more independent spirit, who could set sail with him on his course of life resolved as himself to dare indifferently the storm and the favouring breeze. But Lucy was so beautiful, so devoutly attached to him, of a temper so exquisitely soft and kind, that while he could have wished it were possible to inspire her with a greater degree of firmness and resolution, and while he sometimes became impatient of the extreme fear which she expressed of their attachment being prematurely discovered, he felt that the softness of a mind amounting almost to feebleness, rendered her even dearer to him, as a being who had voluntarily clung to him for protection, and made him the arbiter of her fate, for weal or woe. His feelings towards her at such moments were those which have been since so beautifully expressed by our immortal Joanna Bailey. Thou sweetest thing, that e'er did fix its lightly fibred sprays, to the rude rock, ah, wouldst thou cling to me? Rough and storm-worn I am, yet love me as thou truly dost. I will love thee again with true and honest heart, though all unmeet to be the mate of such sweet gentleness. Thus the very points in which they differed seemed in some measure to ensure the continuance of their mutual affection. If indeed they had so fully appreciated each other's character before the burst of passion in which they hastily pledged their faith to each other, Lucy might have feared Ravenswood too much ever to love him, and he might have construed her softness and docile temper as imbecility, rendering her unworthy of his regard. But they stood pledged to each other, and Lucy only feared that her lover's pride might one day teach him to regret his attachment. Ravenswood, that a mind so ductile as Lucy's might in absence or difficulties be induced by the entreaties or influence of those around her, to renounce the engagement she had formed. "'Do not fear it,' said Lucy, when upon one occasion a hint of such suspicion escaped her lover. "'The mirrors which receive the reflection of all successive objects are framed of hard materials like glass or steel. The softer substances, when they receive an impression, retain it undefaced.' "'This is poetry, Lucy,' said Ravenswood, "'and in poetry there is always fallacy.' and sometimes fiction. Believe me, then, once more, in honest prose, said Lucy, that though I will never wed man without the consent of my parents, yet neither force nor persuasion shall dispose of my hand till you renounce the right I have given you to it. The lovers had ample time for such explanations, 
Henry was now more seldom their companion, being either a most unwilling attendant upon the lessons of his tutor, or a forward volunteer under the instructions of the foresters or grooms. As for the keeper, his mornings were spent in his study, maintaining correspondences of all kinds, and balancing in his anxious mind the various intelligences which he collected from every quarter concerning the expected change of Scottish politics and the probable strength of the parties who were about to struggle for power. At other times he busied himself about arranging and countermanding, and then again arranging, the preparations which he judged necessary for the reception of the Marquis of A., whose arrival had been twice delayed by some necessary cause of detention. In the midst of all these various avocations, political and domestic, he seemed not to observe how much his daughter and his guest were thrown into each other's society, and was censured by many of his neighbours, according to the fashion of neighbours in all countries, for suffering such an intimate connection to take place betwixt two young persons. The only natural explanation was, that he designed them for each other, while in truth his only motive was to temporise and procrastinate until he should discover the real extent of the interest which the Marquis took in Ravenswood's affairs, and the power which he was likely to possess of advancing them. Until these points should be made both clear and manifest, the Lord Keeper resolved that he would do nothing to commit himself, either in one shape or other, and like many cunning persons, he overreached himself deplorably amongst those who had been disposed to censure with the greatest severity the conduct of sir william ashton in permitting the prolonged residence of ravenswood under his roof and his constant attendance on miss ashton was the new laird of girnington and his faithful squire and bottle-holder personages formerly well known to us by the names of haston and bucklaw and his companion captain craigengelt the former had at length succeeded to the extensive property of his long-lived grand-aunt, and to considerable wealth besides, which he had employed in redeeming his paternal acres, by the title appertaining to which he still chose to be designated, notwithstanding Captain Craigengelt had proposed to him a most advantageous mode of vesting the money in Law's scheme, which was just then broached, and offered his services to travel express to Paris for the purpose. But Bucklaw had so far derived wisdom from adversity, and he would listen to no proposal which Craigengelt could invent, which had the slightest tendency to risk his newly acquired independence. He that had once eat peas bannocks, drank sour wine, and slept in the secret chamber at Wolf's Crag, would, he said, prize good cheer and a soft bed as long as he lived, and take special care never to need such hospitality again. Craigengelt therefore found himself disappointed in the first hopes he had entertained of making a good hand of the Laird of Bucklaw. Still, however, he reaped many advantages from his friend's good fortune. Bucklaw, who had never been at all scrupulous in choosing his companions, was accustomed to, and entertained by, a fellow whom he could either laugh with or laugh at, as he had a mind, who would take, according to Scottish phrase, the bit and the buffy, understood all sports, whether within or without doors, and when the laird had a mind for a bottle of wine, no infrequent circumstance, was always ready to save him from the scandal of getting drunk by himself. Upon these terms, Craigengelt was the frequent, almost the constant, inmate of the house of Girnington. In no time, and under no possibility of circumstances, could good have been derived from such an intimacy however its bad consequences might be qualified by the thorough knowledge which Bucklaw possessed of his dependent's character, and the high contempt in which he held it. But, as circumstances stood, this evil communication was particularly liable to corrupt what good principles nature had implanted in the patron. Craigengelt had never forgiven the scorn with which Ravenswood had torn the mask of courage and honesty from his countenance and to exasperate Bucklaw's resentment against him was the safest mode of revenge which occurred to his cowardly yet cunning and malignant disposition. He brought up on all occasions the story of the challenge which Ravenswood had declined to accept, and endeavoured by every possible insinuation to make his patron believe that his honour was concerned in bringing that matter to an issue 
by a present discussion with Ravenswood. But respecting this subject, Bucklaw imposed on him at length a peremptory command of silence. "'I think,' he said, "'the master has treated me unlike a gentleman, and I see no right he had to send me back a cavalier answer when I demanded the satisfaction of one. But he gave me my life once, and in looking the matter over at present, I put myself but on equal terms with him. Should he cross me again, I shall consider the old account as balanced, and his mastership will do well to look to himself. That he should, re-echoed Craigengelt, for when you are in practice, Bucklaw, I would bet a magnum you are through him before the third pass. Then you know nothing of the matter, said Bucklaw, and you never saw him fence. And I know nothing of the matter, said the dependent, a good jest, I promise you. And though I never saw Ravenswood fence, have I not been at Monsieur Sagoon's school, who was the first maitre d'armes at Paris? And have I not been at Signor Poco's at Florence, and mein Herr Durchstossen's at Vienna? And have I not seen all their play? I don't know whether you have or not, said Bucklaw, but what about it, though you had? Only that I will be damned, if ever I saw French, Italian, or High Dutchman ever make foot, hand, and eye keep time half so well as you, Bucklaw. I believe you lie, Craigie, said Bucklaw. However, I can hold my own, both with single rapier, back sword, sword and dagger, broadsword, or case of falchions, and that's as much as any gentleman need know of the matter. And the doubt of what ninety-nine out of a hundred know, said Craigengelt. They learn to change a few thrusts with the small sword, and then, forsooth, they understand the noble art of defence. Now, when I was at Rouen, in the year 1695, there was a chevalier de Chapon, and I went to the opera, where we found three bits of English burkeys. Is it a long story you're going to tell? said Bucklaw, interrupting him without ceremony. Just as you like, answered the parasite, for we made short work of it. "'Then I like it short,' said Bucklaw. "'Is it serious or merry?' "'Devilish serious, I assure you. "'And so they found it. "'For the Chevalier and I—' "'Then I don't like it at all,' said Bucklaw. "'So fill a brimmer of my old auntie's claret, rest her heart. "'And as the Heeland man says, "'Skeer doch na skeer. "'That was what tough old Sir Evan Dhu used to say to me "'when I was out with the metalled lads in 1689.' Craigengelt, he used to say, you are as pretty a fellow as ever held steel in his grip, but you have one fault. If he had known you as long as I have done, said Bucklaw, he would have found out some twenty more. But hand long stories, give us your toast, man. Craigengelt rose, went a tiptoe to the door, peeped out, shut it carefully, came back again, clapped his tarnished gold-laced hat on one side of his head, took his glass in one hand, and touching the hilt of his hanger with the other, named, The King Over the Water. I tell you what it is, Captain Craigengelt, said Bucklaw. I shall keep my mind to myself on these subjects, having too much respect for the memory of my venerable Aunt Gurnington to put her lands and tenements in the way of committing treason against established authority. Bring me King James to Edinburgh, Captain with thirty thousand men at his back, and I'll tell you what I think about his title. But as for running my neck into a noose, and my good broad lands into the statutory penalties, in that case made and provided, rely upon it, you will find me no such fool. So when you mean to vapour with your hanger and your dram-cup, in support of treasonable toasts, you must find your liquor and company elsewhere. Well then, said Craigengelt, Name the toast yourself, and be it what it like. I'll pledge you, were it a mile to the bottom. And I'll give you a toast that deserves it, my boy, said Bucklaw. What say you to Miss Lucy Ashton? Up with it, said the captain, as he tossed off his brimmer. The bonniest lass in Lothian. What a pity the old snick drawing Wigamore, her father, is about to throw her away upon that rag of pride and beggary, the master of Ravenswood. "'That's not quite so clear,' said Bucklaw, in a tone which, though it seemed indifferent, excited his companion's eager curiosity, and not that only, but also his hope of working himself into some sort of confidence, 
which might make him necessary to his patron, being by no means satisfied to rest on mere sufferance, if he could form by art or industry a more permanent title to his favour. "'I thought,' said he, after a moment's pause, "'that was a settled matter. They are continually together, and nothing else is spoken of betwixt Lammer Law and Traprain. "'They may say what they please,' replied his patron, "'but I know better, and I'll give you Miss Lucy Ashton's health again, my boy.' "'And I would drink it on my knee,' said Craigengelt, "'if I thought the girl had the spirit to jilt that damned son of a Spaniard. "'I am to request you will not use the word jilt and Miss Ashton's name together,' said Bucklaw gravely. "'Jilt, did I say? Discard, my lad of acres. "'By Jove, I meant to discard,' replied Craigengelt. "'And I hope she'll discard him like a small card at piquet, "'and take in the King of Hearts, my boy. "'But yet—' "'But what?' said his patron. "'But yet I know for certain they are ours together alone, "'and in the woods and the fields. "'That's her foolish father's dotage. "'That will be soon put out of the lass's head, "'if it ever gets into it,' answered Bucklaw. "'And now fill your glass again, Captain. "'I am going to make you happy. "'I am going to let you into a secret, a plot, a noosing plot. "'Only the noose is but typical.' "'A marrying matter?' said Craigengelt, and his jaw fell as he asked the question, for he suspected that matrimony would render his situation at Gurnington much more precarious than during the jolly days of his patron's bachelorhood. "'Aye, a marriage man,' said Bucklaw. "'But wherefore droops thy mighty spirit, and why grow the rubies on thy cheek so pale? The board will have a corner, and the corner will have a trencher, and the trencher will have a glass beside it.' and the board end shall be filled, and the trencher and the glass shall be replenished for thee, if all the petticoats in Lothian had sworn the contrary. What, man, I am not the boy to put myself into leading strings. So says many an honest fellow, said Craigengelt, and some of my special friends. But curse me if I know the reason, the women could never bear me, and always contrived to trundle me out of favour before the honeymoon was over. If you could have kept your ground till that was over, you might have made a good year's pension, said Bucklaw. But I never could, answered the dejected parasite. There was my lord Castlecuddy. We were hand in glove. I rode his horses, borrowed money both for him and from him, trained his hawks, and taught him how to lay his bets. And when he took a fancy of marrying, I married him to Katie Glegg whom I thought myself as sure of as man could be of woman. Egad, she had me out of the house, as if I had run on wheels, within the first fortnight. Well, replied Bucklaw, I think I have nothing of Castle Cuddy about me, or Lucy of Katie Glegg. But you see, the thing will go on whether you like it or no. The only question is, will you be useful? Useful? exclaimed the captain. And to thee, my lad of lands, my darling boy, whom I would trample barefooted through the world for, name time, place, mode, and circumstances, and see if I will not be useful in all uses that can be devised. Why, then, you must ride two hundred miles for me, said the patron. A thousand, and call them a flea's leap, answered the dependent. I'll cause saddle my horse directly. "'Better stay till you know where you are to go, and what you are to do,' quoth Bucklaw. "'You know I have a kinswoman in Northumberland, Lady Blenkinsop by name, whose old acquaintance I had the misfortune to lose in the period of my poverty, but the light of whose countenance shone forth upon me when the sun of my prosperity began to rise.' "'Damn all such double-faced jades!' exclaimed Craigengelt heroically. "'This I will say for John Craigengelt that he is his friend's friend through good report and bad report, poverty and riches, and you know something of that yourself, Bucklaw. I have not forgot your merits, said his patron. I do remember that in my extremities you had a mind to crimp me for the service of the French king, or of the pretender, and moreover that you afterwards lent me a score of pieces when, as I firmly believe, you had heard the news that old Lady Gurnington had a touch of the dead palsy. But don't be downcast, John. 
I believe, after all, you like me very well in your way, and it is my misfortune to have no better counsellor at present. To return to this Lady Blenkinsop, you must know she is a close confederate of Duchess Sarah. What? Of Sal Jennings? exclaimed Craigengelt. Then she must be a good one. Hold your tongue, and keep your Tory rants to yourself, if it be possible, said Bucklaw. I tell you that through the Duchess of Marlborough has this Northumbrian cousin of mine become a crony of Lady Ashton, the keeper's wife, or, I may say, the Lord Keeper's lady keeper, and she has favoured Lady Blenkinsop with a visit on her return from London, and is just now at her old mansion house on the banks of the Wansbeck. No, sir, as it has been the use and want of these ladies to consider their husbands as of no importance in the management of their own families, it has been their present pleasure, without consulting Sir William Ashton, to put on the tapis a matrimonial alliance, to be concluded between Lucy Ashton and my own right honourable self, Lady Ashton acting as self-constituted plenipotentiary on the part of her daughter and husband, and Mother Blenkinsop, equally unaccredited, doing me the honour to be my representative. You may suppose I was a little astonished when I found that a treaty in which I was so considerably interested had advanced a good way before I was even consulted. Capo me, if I think that was according to the rules of the game, said his confidant. And pray, what answer did you return? Why, my first thought was to send the treaty to the devil, and the negotiators along with it, for a couple of meddling old women. My next was to laugh very heartily, and my third and last was a settled opinion that the thing was reasonable, and would suit me well enough. Why, I thought you had never seen the wench but once, and then she had her riding mask on. I am sure you told me so. Aye, but I liked her very well then, and Ravenswood's dirty usage of me, shutting me out of doors to dine with the lackeys, because he had the Lord Keeper, forsooth, and his daughter, to be guests in his beggarly castle of starvation. Damn me, Craigengelt, if I ever forgive him till I play him as good a trick. No more you should, if you are a lad of metal, said Craigengelt, the matter now taking a turn in which he could sympathise. And if you carry this wench from him, it will break his heart. That it will not, said Bucklaw. His heart is all steeled over with reason and philosophy, things that you, Craigie, know nothing about more than myself, God help me. But it will break his pride, though, and that's what I'm driving at. Distance me, said Craigengelt, but I know the reason now of his unmannerly behaviour at his old tumble-down tower yonder. Ashamed of your company? No, no, gad, he was afraid you would cut in and carry off the girl. Eh, Craigengelt? said Bucklaw. Do you really think so? But no, no, he is a devilish deal prettier man than I am. Who, he? exclaimed the parasite. He's as black as the crook, and for his size, he's a tall fellow to be sure, but give me a light, stout, middle-sized. Plague on thee, said Bucklaw, interrupting him, and on me for listening to you. You would say as much if I were hunchbacked. But as to Ravenswood, he has kept no terms with me. I'll keep none with him. If I can win this girl from him, I will win her. Win her? It's blood you shall win her. Point, quin, and quatorz, my king of trumps. You shall peek, repeek, and capot him. Prithee, stop thy gambling cant for one instant, said Bucklaw. Things have come thus far that I have entertained the proposal of my kinswoman, agreed to the terms of jointure, amount of fortune, and so forth, and that the affair is to go forward when Lady Ashton comes down, for she takes her daughter and her son in her own hand. Now they want me to send up a confidential person with some writings. By this good win I'll ride to the end of the world, the very gates of Jericho, and the judgment seat of Prester John for thee, ejaculated the captain. Why, I believe you would do something for me, and a great deal for yourself. Now, any one could carry the writings, but you will have a little more to do. You must contrive to drop out before my Lady Ashton, just as if it were a matter of little consequence, the residence of Ravenswood at her husband's house, and his close intercourse with Miss Ashton. 
and you may tell her that all the country talks of a visit from the Marquis of A, as it is supposed, to make up the match betwixt Ravenswood and her daughter. I should like to hear what she says to all this, for, rat me, if I have any idea of starting for the plate at all, if Ravenswood is to win the race, and he has odds against me already. Never a bit. The wench has too much sense, and in that belief I drink her health a third time, and were time and place fitting, I would drink it on bended knees, and he that would not pledge me, I would make his guts garter his stockings. Hark ye, Craigengelt, as you are going into the society of women of rank, said Bucklaw, I'll thank ye to forget your strange blackguard oaths and dams. I'll write to them, though, that you are a blunt, untaught fellow. Ay, ay, replied Craigengelt, a plain, blunt, honest, downright soldier. Not too honest, not too much of the soldier neither, but such as thou art, it is my luck to need thee, for I must have spurs put to Lady Ashton's motions. I'll dash them up to the rowelheads, said Craigengelt. She shall come here at the gallop, like a cow chased by a whole nest of hornets, and her tail over her rump, like a corkscrew. And hear ye, Craigie, said Bucklaw, your boots and doublet are good enough to drink in, as the man says in the play, but they are somewhat too greasy for tea-table service. Prithee, get thyself a little better rigged out, and here is to pay all charges. Nay, Bucklaw, on my soul, man, you use me ill. However, added Craigengelt, pocketing the money, if you will have me so far indebted to you, I must be conforming. Well, horse and away, said the patron, so soon as you have got your riding livery in trim. You may ride the black crop here, and hark ye, I'll make you a present of him to boot. I drink to the good luck of my mission, answered the ambassador, in a half-pint bumper. I thank ye, Craigie, and pledge you. I see nothing against it, but the father or the girl taking a tantrum, and I am told the mother can wind them both round her little finger. Take care not to affront her with any of your Jacobite jargon. Oh, ay, true, she is a Whig, and a friend of old Sal of Marlborough. Thank my stars, I can hoist any colours at a pinch. I have fought as hard under John Churchill as ever I did under Dundee or the Duke of Berwick. I verily believe you, Craigie, said the Lord of the Mansion. But, Craigie, do you, pray, step down to the cellar and fetch us up a bottle of the Burgundy, 1678. It is in the fourth bin from the right-hand turn. And I say, Craigie, you may fetch up half a dozen whilst you are about it. Ye gad, we'll make a night on't. End of chapter 21